My name is Victor Reyes, and I'm a retired judge from Pueblo, Colorado, and I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, we have a lot, a uh, diversity of professions um, with us today, and this topic uh, that we've titled Speaking Justice, Providing Victims and Litigants Language Access in the Courts is a, an extremely important, relevant topic as um, we are going through so many changes and have been going through so many changes um, in the country, um, having to do with access to courts, um, um, uh, when the diversity of the people accessing the courts. And the presentation that we're doing today isn't just for those courts who already may have some of these uh, mechanisms in place and these services in place, but also for courts who want to look at developing and how to developing. And I'm hoping that even in this medium, we're able to have a robust conversation about, um, it's a topic that's very near and dear to me. It has been since I was a public defender representing people from different nations who were very, very um, overwhelmed um, by the entire process. Um, so, Leslie? Sure. Thank you, Judge Race. Um, wanted to welcome everyone. Um, and on, oops, sorry, one second, get this right. On behalf of, uh, first one, thank OVW and State Justice Institute, the Office of Violence Against Women and SJI, who supported this effort today. The opinions and what you'll hear us talk about today are those of the presenters and don't necessarily reflect the views of the Department of Justice or State Justice Institute, the Office of Violence Against Women. Um, so I welcome you all here. And I guess what I'll do is I'll start, um, maybe I'll just introduce myself since I'm talking and then turn it over to our lead expert here um, from DOJ and then we'll end with Judge Race. So, um, my name is Leslie Orloff. Um, I direct the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project at American University Washington College of Law. And I also help direct the National Judicial Network. We staff it. So I welcome all of you here, those of you that are judges, family lawyers, victim advocates. This is an area where all of us working together can really help get better outcomes for our immigrant victim clients, um, domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, and child abuse, and all litigants um, in the courts, um, which is why I think this is so important. So I'm really happy to have you all here. Um, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to Christine. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you, um, Leslie, and to the National Judicial Network and all the staff behind the scenes. Really honored to be here with Judge Reyes and Leslie and my colleagues and such an amazing and really large uh, audience. So thank you everyone. Um, as Leslie said, my name is Christine Stoneman and I am the Chief of the Federal Coordination and Compliance Section at the Civil Rights Division at the US Department of Justice. And um, the Civil Rights Division is committed to removing barriers to equal access to justice. And at FCS, the Federal Coordination and Compliance Section, my job is to lead an amazing team focused on ensuring non-discrimination by recipients of federal funds and implementing certain executive orders that also apply those non-discrimination standards to federal agencies themselves and require coordination across federal civil rights offices to ensure effective enforcement. So Title VI is kind of the crown jewel, a primary statute that FCS and my team enforce. And I'm um, just speaking of my team, I just wanna briefly introduce to you uh, attorney Anissa Rahim, who's an attorney at FCS in my section, and she joined us not all that long ago, but has been doing courts language access work and language access advocacy for many, many years. Um, and she helps lead several language access initiatives in our office, including the courts language access initiative. And she'll be providing you her information as well, so that, you know, at the end of this, when you want to follow up with um, our section, you can follow up with one of us. Thanks, Judge Reyes. Thank you. And as I indicated earlier, my name is Victor Reyes. I'm a retired judge um, in Colorado. I've been uh, uh, spent 15 years as public defender and 15 years as a uh, general jurisdiction judge, a district judge. And as I indicated before, this is an issue that I have been dealing with in many different forums since um, 1984. So the fact that we're still having this conversation um, and we're still having this many issues 40 years later 
um, shows that you know we've done work and we all recognize that, but we have so much more to go. Great, thank you. So we're gonna start um, with the help of Mackenzie uh, to have a poll to get a sense of who you are on who, who's attending this webinar. So if you could please uh, fill in the, in the poll and if you type other, if you could tell us what that means, that would be lovely. And Mackenzie, do you decide when to end the poll or me, or how do we do that? We can do however you'd like. If you want to just say end the poll, I can do that. Okay, I'll let you take control so I don't hit the wrong buttons. Okay, I'll just kind of wait to see till it evens out. Exactly, we have about, it looks like 75% or more of the people have responded. I think that's pretty good. Okay, we can end that now. Okay. So as you see, um, everybody from you share you're sharing the results, right? There we go. Um, so about 22% of you are judges or court staff, 13% family lawyers, prosecutors, law enforcement, and their victim witness staff are about 2%, and 37% are victim advocates. And then if I look in the chat, we've got paralegals, workers' rights people, legal aid attorneys. Um, I'm trying to see what else. Professors, interpreters, uh, coordinated people that are coordinating domestic violence programs and interpretation programs. That's great. Well, we welcome you all here. And uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Oh, that I can do that. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to encourage judges um, to join the National Judicial Network. It is an incredible forum for the issues of human trafficking and immigration. You have some of the, uh, the best qualified, uh, best expert judges in these fields as part of the advisory council, as part of the organization. And what the beauty about this is, is you have an, an ability to have conversations. We have different type of programs. We have peer-to-peer -peer training. You are always getting updated on the changes, even the rules changes that may be um, uh, happening uh, through the communications that um, NIWAP and the National Judicial Network uh, provide. And you know it's very important too, because sometimes we have a lot of questions. And you know, Leslie, I, I've had many conversations with her, and I, you know, I know she's been on the ground floor for many of the laws. She's been, as as I, I've heard several times, in the room, literally in the room, as they're having the discussions. So the expertise that you have available to you is it, 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 something that that um, only you know I think only this organization can provide. Um, so as you can see, there's different uh, methods of that that we have. We have tools, bench, uh, bench cards. There's going to be some uh, links also provided um, at the end of this presentation. So I would strongly encourage uh, the judges who are in this program. If you're not a member already, very, sim you know, very simple to sign up. Please join the organization. And it's free. It doesn't cost anything. And we don't bug you a lot. We just send you updates and opportunities to come to great learning opportunities like today's webinar. Um, and for the family lawyers, victim advocates, and law enforcement and prosecutors um, in the room are attending, we also have a similar peer-to-peer -peer opportunity called Communities of Practice that are a roundtable that we run for those groups. And these are the links to sign up. We're going to circulate all of these links, the PowerPoint, the recording, um, uh, and and also any questions, uh, we're gonna to try to answer as many of your questions today as we proceed with the webinar, but should there be questions that we don't get to, we'll send a follow-up email with a Q&A that has those information and answers that um, uh, Christine has kindly offered to help answer if there's things outstanding and we'll do the same at NUAP. So um, we're gonna start with okay. in now. Yeah, the learning objectives and what we're trying to accomplish in the hour and a half that we're going to be here today is understand what the federal language access laws require of the courts. Like I said, we're so blessed to have Christine here. You know, once again, you know, the person who is there on uh, on the on the um, you know where the rubber hits the road, the one who makes a lot of decisions concerning 
um, what happens not only courts, but other actors within the system. Um, we can identify steps that judges can take in their courtrooms and that attorneys can take in their cases in and out of their courtroom. Um, and that everyone in the community, this is not just um, a, an issue that can be resolved by one act or another. Definitely need um, look, and to look at this as a coordinated community response to provide the best um, resources as possible. And then we're going to go through a, a case study and recognize you know, points um, in cases where the lack of language access can negatively impact immigrant victims, litigants, and their children. I'm sure that we all have anecdotes about certain situations where you know, at times maybe even tragic results uh, uh, may have happened based upon the fact that this service was not provided to the people who most needed it. Christine? Thank you again, Judge Reyes. Um, so as you all know, courts have a solemn duty to uphold equal protection under the law for all, and there is no place for bias, discrimination, or prejudice in our courts. And equal justice is realized when every person can access and participate equally in court proceedings, programs, and mandated activities. And one critical way that courts can uphold and promote the independence, integrity, and impartiality of the judiciary is by removing policies and practices that create language barriers. So for many years, the Civil Rights Division has worked to ensure that courts receiving federal financial assistance so those are state courts. Uh, federal courts are not considered recipients of federal financial assistance in, in the same way under Title VI. Um, they, that, that those courts take necessary steps to comply with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and to improve access to justice for all court users with limited English proficiency, or sometimes we say LEP. Through the years, we have addressed cases where prosecutors were used to interpret it for criminal defendants where children were used to interpret for parents in custody proceedings, where tenants with limited English proficiency have been evicted without knowing why, or perhaps even knowing that they were evicted, uh, where victims of domestic violence have been unable to obtain restraining orders due to lack of inter interpretation and other situations that many of you are probably aware of, and maybe why you're on this webinar. I just wanted to step back and say that one of the matters early on that I encountered working with the Department of Justice um, and the Department of Health and Human Services and the Southern Poverty Law Center provides one of the centering experiences on the importance of this work for me. It's one of the driving forces that um, initially brought CRT, the Civil Rights Division, sorry, uh, to really push for change. So in 2008, Cirilla Baltazar Cruz was admitted into a hospital in Pascagoula, Mississippi and gave birth to a daughter. A Mexican national, Ms. Cruz is a member of the Chitino indigenous group from Southern Mexico and spoke very limited Spanish and virtually no English. The hospital did not seek to find a Chitino English interpreter. And although a Chitino and Spanish speaking cousin arrived at the hospital within a day of her um, arrive, the, of, of delivery of the child, the hospital officials failed to allow him to even try to communicate for Ms. Cruz and just assumed she spoke Spanish. Instead, hospital officials used a Spanish English interpreter who was unable effectively to communicate with Ms. Cruz, who then did not know what she was supposed to be doing. So the issue of custody of Ms. Cruz's baby was presented to the Jackson County Youth Court. And in November of 2008, the youth court issued a finding of neglect based in part on incorrect information from the hospital and placed Ms. Cruz's baby in foster care. Um, and uh, beginning with that initial November hearing and continuing through to May of 2009, the youth court in multiple hearings failed to meet its responsibility to provide Ms. Cruz with appropriate language assistance using Ms. Cruz's cousin, whose schooling ended at sixth grade, to interpret Chitino to Spanish and a second interpreter to interpret Spanish to English when that happened at all. So these hearings then led to a ruling in May 2009 to initiate termination of parental rights. And shockingly, at the same hearing, the youth court judge commented, and this is a quote from the transcript, 
I know it's kind of unfair sitting here when she doesn't understand what I'm saying. In addition, the court severely limited Ms. Cruz's contacts with her daughter over the same period. Now, the Southern Poverty Law, Law Center was ultimately able to prevent the termination of Ms. Cruz's parental rights with some support from the federal government, including DOJ and HHS. But the court's failure to provide Ms. Cruz with effective language assistance resulted in a lost year in relationship with that baby. And the baby was removed right after 2008 and the November 2008 hearing and not returned until 2009. November 2009. Um, and eventually, legal custody was reestablished. Re and I tell this because in many ways, this, um, this experience, this way in which our office sort of um, became involved, um, even though really the Southern Property Law Center was driving this work, um, it really was the impetus for my section to take even uh, a greater role in, in ensuring language access in um, under Title VI in the state courts. So what does that mean? So Title VI, uh, just to, many of you know this, but I'm just gonna go through it really quickly. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, of course, um, was enacted as part of the landmark uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. And we're gonna be having a very big anniversary of that this July. It prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin by recipients of federal financial assistance. Um, there's a lot of information that you can find out about Title VI um, on our website, and um, and that will be that's provided in the chat. That will be provided in in the links that you'll see. So you don't have to you know sort of write it all down. But um, there's a Title VI manual. You can get as in depth as you would like on Title VI. So. Um, one, one of the things that's really important for purposes of this conversation is that um, that national origin can include uh, language, culture, ancestry, or other social characteristics. And so while Title VI doesn't explicitly in the statute say language, the um, connection to language is very clear as the Supreme Court has acknowledged and has federal agencies and other courts have acknowledged for decades now. So what does the Civil Rights Division do to enforce Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964? So um, we investigate reports of failure to provide adequate language services. We get those reports through our portal and we'll um, definitely be able to provide that information to you. We sometimes, um, frankly, read about challenges um, that have been happening in the courts and reach out to those courts to try to resolve those challenges. And um, sometimes our uh, the courts reach out to us and we work in a sort of more of a technical assistance role to ensure um, language access. Now we've also put out a number of resources. We have a state courts webpage that again, you will have access to. And um, we put out letters uh, to courts systems. We do a lot of training um, and, and uh, we provide examples of all of our settlement agreements on those web pages, so that you can sort of see what it is, and courts can see what it is that other courts are doing in order to comply with Title VI. So, sadly, the example I gave you um, that started all of this is not unheard of still. So, recently there was another situation where a limited English proficient father who was appearing pro se before a family court in Oklahoma was denied an interpreter for his child custody hearings and thus had no idea what was happening during the proceedings, even though it involved his ability to see his child. Again, after receiving a complaint and investigating, we were actually able to work with Oklahoma very successfully to change in pretty quick time its policies and practices so this sort of thing would not happen again. We worked together for over a year and then entered into a resolution agreement in 2023 and in that time, Oklahoma hired its first statewide language access coordinator and sought and obtained a legislative change to eliminate interpreter fees for all court users, among other things. So thank you for asking about the, the clue. I'll get to that in just a second. Um, I, I'm just going to talk a little bit more about some of the examples. So um, in the Civil Rights Division, we have de developed really strong working relationships with many state and local courts, including many of the courts here that you'll see. Um, some of these courts are, hang on just a second, I'm sorry. There we go. 
Um, some of these courts we have in the in the yellow um, receipt, we have entered into agreements, uh, settlement agreements. Sometimes we call them memorandum of understanding. Sometimes we call them memorandum of agreement. Um, and then there are towns or counties rather that are in the little boxes. So the yellow is where we've had a statewide agreement and the, the, the yellowed of the whole state and the yellow boxes are where we've had sort of uh, countywide agreements. In addition, we've worked with the states in blue on a number of tech, in, in, on technical assistance. Um, and, uh, and these are just examples. There are other states where we've had, um, we at DOJ have had um, some connection, but these are the ones that stood out for us to share. In Vermont, as an example, we entered into a collaborative technical assistance agreement the last of two years, and my staff worked with the Vermont court staff throughout that period. We shared resources, provided extensive oral and written analysis on many drafts of court documents, including the court's language access plan. Um, and in South Dakota, we reached out to the South Dakota judiciary after we received a complaint from legal aid um, about reported lack of language services. The judiciary took immediate actions to address the Title VI concerns, including introducing a bill in the legislature to expand access to court interpreters and translators for individuals with limited English proficiency in all civil cases. The judiciary was also able to secure an additional $50,000 from the legislature to provide interpreters and translators in civil costs, uh, in civil cases um, at no cost, so to support the, the, court, the counties in those efforts. We've also tracked improvements in state court policies on language assistance um, services motivated directly or indirectly by our efforts. Um, so I just wanted to say on this previous slide, that all of our efforts are reflected on that. But um, in this slide, we I don't think the colors actually mean anything. I think the, the bottom line is that at least 47 states now recognize a right to an interpreter in some civil proceedings for at least some court user, users. So when we first started doing this work, what we saw was that the norm was largely that um, uh, interpreters would be provided in criminal cases and some small, small portion of civil cases that looked sort of maybe were criminal adjacent. Um, and they may or may not have been paid for by the 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 court system. So they may have been charged as fees, right, to the, the criminal defendant, for instance. Um, at this point, where we are, I think, <clears throat> is that the norm is much more, the, <clears throat> excuse me, that the national norm is not perfect by any stretch, but the there are far, far, far more states that are providing interpreters um, free of charge in criminal cases and in at least some number, if not all, civil cases. So that's where we get the 47 states. Nothing perfect about this situation, but it is getting better, it is trending better. Um, and part of the reason is the people on this call, part of the reason is the, the team that I work with, part of the reason is the National Center on State Courts, the ABA Standards, um, the National Le Language Access Advocacy Network, and many others. It's a multi-legged multi stool. So I wanted to just um, tell a couple of more anecdotes by way of example of what has been happening and where our work at the Department of Justice has, um, where, we, where, where we've worked really, um, I think, extensively and also where with a state where we didn't actually work very extensively and they took a lot of steps on their own. So I'm gonna start with California. So there was a situation where a Korean speaking grandmother was seeking a protective order from her abusive landlord. Um, and the court was refusing language services in Los Angeles for this Korean speaking grandmother seeking a protective order. Legal Aid um, uh, of Los Angeles, Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles filed a Title VI complaint with our office. And our investigation uncovered widespread language access concerns, not only in LA, but across the state of California. Now, 
after it took some time, but with the cooperation of the California judiciary, the Los Angeles courts, the input and advocacy of legal aid uh, across the state, not just in LA, public defenders, community advocates and interpreters, and the partnership between my office and the local US Attorney's Office, we were able to achieve a statewide policy, budgetary and language uh, legislative changes, um, and eventually in LA, a settlement agreement to ensure that LEP individuals have interpreters in hearings across the state. The National Center for State Courts then ended up providing significant te technical assistance to the California Administrative Office of the Courts with ju judicial leaders helping to press for long-term sustained change. So this is a really important example of the many legs of the stool that's necessary to make long-term change. Um, and what I would just say here too is that even even in California, where there has been success and it's been a while, there are still challenges and we still sometimes receive complaints out of California and often because of the relationship and the agreement that we had with California, we're able to make a phone call and um, and see what we can do to, to fix the situation because it may just be that the policy isn't being implemented properly in that in individual instance. All right, so I want to flip to Mississippi, where a little while ago, Mississippi hired its first full-time language access coordinator for the administrative offices of the courts. And she is responsible for court interpreter training and certification and for ensuring Mississippi State Judiciary is in compliance with federal rules and regulations regarding court interpreters. So I met this woman, her name is Deanie Miller, at an ABA Seattle University convening last month. And her story, on her panel was remarkable. As she tells it, she had never had a need for an interpreter in her entire career and didn't know much about the position she applied for. She's really quite funny. If you ever want to get the story from her, it's pretty hilarious. Um, but so she tells me she immersed herself in all of the Department of Justice guidance, letters, settlement agreements with all of the other courts that are on our website and other resources, along with those from the National Center for State Courts and the Council of um, Language Access Coordinators and the ABA Standards. She then set about changing Mississippi law and practice by working with others to advance, draft and advance a successful amendment to the Mississippi, um, to the Mississippi law requiring language interpreters for people with limited English proficiency, sorry, in court proceedings to provide broader access to assistance for people who don't understand English. So the AOC requested this legislative change, which she tells me she drafted. And, um, and in the summer of this year, it went into effect, July of 2023, sorry. Um, it mandates court appointment of qualified interpreters in criminal cases at no cost to defendants with the cost borne by the county or municipality and also in with civil civil cases. Um, it uh, it also requires court interpreters to be paid by the county or the municipality in, in civil cases, as I said. So LEP individuals are no longer having to pay for a court interpreter. So um, Dini points out that this provision ensures that LEP individuals have a right to interpreter to interpreter in all phases of litigation and also that it applies to not only the litigants, but also to witnesses. So I share this story because um, while, while certainly the work of the rest of us had an effect on this, this was you know one person coming in and saying, hey, we don't seem to be in line with federal law or really the norm and I'm gonna do something about it. And she did. Um, and it's, pretty, it's a pretty remarkable story. Christine, there's a question you may want to address. Somebody's asking about um, when a spoken interpreter is provided or requested at a court hearing, how many interpreters do you need? Um, like what's what's best practice? Yeah. So, so um, that's a really good question and it's gonna depend on how long the, the, um, the uh, interpretation is or how long the hearing is. Um, I think, you know, with my understanding is that with ASL interpretation, there's a, a, a bit more of a standard. Um, and I would have to go back and look at the ABA standards on this question and at the um, at the NAGIT standards on this question. But it, obviously, the longer a hearing is, the more likely or, or certainly a trial, the more likely you are, you are to need more than one interpreter 
Yeah, we had we had three hung uh, interpreters during a trial that I had for a couple of weeks, and you know, and they were able to determine among themselves the reasonable time for them to to be able to interpret effectively. Um, and so I think that's a very important point. Another point, Christine, maybe we could address too, um, if if you would, is when you do have an interpreter who's there for the court any issues having to do with the attorney speaking confidentially with the client and what may arise out of that um, and, and, and how many interpreters would you need for that? Do, does the attorney have one with their client so they can communicate confidentially and, and then a separate one for the court? And then, I was just but, gonna say in domestic violence cases, you wanna be, if both parties are, or, or like domestic violence, divorce, custody, where both parties need interpreter, you know, generally speaking, they each have their own interpreters as opposed to one person between the two, which is the old fashioned way we used to do it back when we shouldn't have been doing it in the eighties. <laughs> I think there's been a lot of um, improvement in understanding of the, um, the task of interpreting, the skill, the profession of interpreting, um, and the importance of it, it still has a way to go, right? We still have a way to go in that area. And, um, you know, I've, I've witnessed, I've seen really good demonstrations of interpreting, including relay interpreting, um, where, you know, you're going from, let's say, quiche to Spanish to English and back. And it's um, it, it's tremendously helpful to have sort of that kind of experience before you go into, you know, as an attorney or a judge or anyone, an advocate who, you know, before you go into a situation where you really need to be able to um, use an interpreter effectively in, um, in a court situation, I think it's really helpful to have that practice. And there are various opportunities, I think, on the web to at least watch those sorts of things. Um, it's really, really, really important that the whole aspect of the professional, it, the 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 professionalism of interpreters and what it takes to be a really good interpreter, um, particularly in a court sitting, and certainly in a while you're doing interpretation that is um, simultaneous interpretation to when the English is being spoken, it's it's an incredible job. Yeah. So I just wanted to say, to, to point out a couple of things, a few things that we're really asking courts to do um, and to continue to improve upon, whether that be in our letters that we send to courts or in our settlement agreements or on calls like this. Um, so one is to make sure that they are developing a statewide language access plan to provide greater services to court users. And this is actually the kind of plan that could include the sorts of things that you're talking about, which is like, how are we, you know, how are we certifying interpreters? How are we getting, um, you know, building the pool of interpreters? How are we working with universities? How are we working across states? Um, how are we using VRI when that's appropriate um, to make sure that we have the, the language, the language interpreters necessary um, when we need them? And but also all of the sort of logistics, like who's in charge of what, who's paying for what, um, what uh, uh, you know, who is the language access coordinator for each area? Um, does your database show that somebody the first time you you know in the, does your case management system show that somebody in that case needs an interpreter so that you're not having to reschedule every time because something didn't pop up as needing an interpreter when it was scheduled, those kinds of things. Um, I guess the biggest issue is that we want to make sure that state courts are providing oral and written language assistance services at no cost in all civil and criminal proceedings um, and, and operations, regardless of indigency status. This, of course, is a, an unmet goal in a lot of places, but we are we are getting there. Well, Christina, I have a question. Yeah. Um, as a judge, um, I'm thinking that, you know, I've heard the word statewide systems, state uh, and yes. office of court administrators. But I know there is a substantial amount of people who are in municipal courts. Yes. Aren't part of those state. You know, I mean, it's, it's the cities themselves. Um, when in agreements are entered with states or 
with some organization, does that exclude those smaller jurisdiction courts? That's a it's a great question, Judge Reyes, and it it depends uh, because it depends on whether or not that jurisdiction, that municipality, is subject to um, Title VI. So if that municipality is part of a either part of a broader system that receives federal financial assistance or is itself directly receiving federal financial assistance, then it, then there's jurisdiction under Title VI. Um, if not, then obviously these courts would be better served, best served to be providing interpreters regardless, right? Um, and um, and the best practices under Title VI or the practice compliance practices under Title VI are helpful not only for the LEP individual, but also for the courts and the judges and the system and, and the integrity of the system. So there are all sorts of reasons beyond compliance with Title VI why um, any court system should be doing all of this, but certainly if the municipal court system is receiving federal financial assistance, it needs to be complying with Title VI. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's jump in here, Christine. I just want to clarify one point, and you'll, um, and that is when you say federal financial assistance, it's not necessarily only financial assistance for the, it could be any kind of financial assistance for anything that the court is doing yes. that the federal government not limited necessarily to a language access program. Oh, 100%. That's exactly right. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's actually some really good case law on that point. Um, and, um, and then uh, the Civil Rights Restoration Act came about and fixed, uh, fixed Title VI. So it's very clear that um, if there's money going to any portion of the program activity, then the entire program activity is covered. Um, and so, uh, yes, so if money is going to a drug court in a jurisdiction, the, 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 the entire, if that drug court is part of a broader system, then the entire system is covered. So, I, and, and, and I know that, I know that a lot of states get, God, I think the, the name, it's been a while, burn money. I think uh -huh. there was, is that what it is? Yeah, so, JAG burn money, JAG burn grants, yep. Okay, yeah. and, and, but that's a small amount, but still they get that. And that would qualify them. Absolutely. So the, there are multiple ways. So there's the burn JAG money. Often the times that goes to a state administrating ad agency. And then, um, and then you know, the I'm not going to say they fight, people fight for it, but, you know, there's jockeying for that money. And I'm told by court systems that they frequently, um, that, that, that they have not been in a position sometimes to jockey for that money, but we really encourage folks to go in and, and get, you know, to really advocate for that money um, for the courts. In addition, and so there, there is definitely a jag, uh, burn jag money, those big, big um, block grants. Some of that money goes to courts uh, throughout the country. In addition, OVW gives out grants that go to courts and HHS actually gives out a number of grants that go to courts. Um, there are others as well, but those are some of the main places where federal funding goes to court systems. Yeah. Um, in addition, it's really important that folks know <laughs> that they can ask for language assistance um, and, and that it's free of charge. You know, people often I hear, I hear advocates telling me this a lot. I hear families telling me this a lot. They don't want to be, they're not going to ask necessarily. They don't want to be as quote burden, if you will. And for, for there to be a notice that basically says, hey, this is our job. This is what we do. We provide this service. And it's actually a service for us too, by the way, um, is really important so that people know they can access um, interpreters and that they won't be charged for them. One of the things we also have seen a lot of um, since, especially since the pandemic, right, is the, is the, the really important influence of video remote, video remote, video remote interpreting, um, and just video remote hearings generally, not just not just interpreting, and um, in many ways, remote hearings can be video hearings can be more accessible for people, right? Uh, for all sorts of reasons. There are downsides, as we all know. One of the downsides could be that. Um, that you know, the, adding the complication of language uh, means that it's hard to upload documents or whatever the the person who's on the uh, you know whoever the whatever the litigant is supposed to do to make sure that they're fully taking advantage of that video remote option. 
if they don't know how to do that because the instructions aren't in a language they understand, then that is not an accessible process for them. Um, and also, you know, video remote and telephonic interpreters um, is is a, a hugely important. Um, uh, those are great tools, particularly for shorter hearings, right? For shorter, but there are limitations. And so creating and issuing interpreter guidance for court staff and judges around what works and what doesn't in video remote and telephonic is very helpful. Again, the ABA is putting out, um, is working on some new standards in this area. And so there's work being done and this community here can uh, is, is a perfect community to be weighing in on those. Um, really important to create and provide language access training for court staff and judges. I will say, even in the Civil Rights Division, we train every single staff member who comes in um, about how to use like a telephonic interpretation system and how to use how to use interpreters. And if you, like I said, if you've never had the practice, it can be a little intimidating, but um, and if you don't know, you don't know. Like if you're in the court's office and you get clerk's office and you don't know, then you're not gonna be able to provide the services. So making sure that folks are trained and maintaining facing public facing websites explaining in English and non-English how to request interpreter and translation services. These are all uh, really important things that we're still looking for courts to do in many instances. And, and I think that's also the second point to me is an issue of judicial leadership, which I'm gonna talk a lot about, is that if you know there's an issue in your community, you know, at least now we have a, a face that we can put together with the organization in order to reach out to DOJ uh, and get that provided even for your jurisdiction, not necessarily having to go through the state court administrator's office. Am I correct about that? For which the training? For the training. Oh, sure. Yeah, we'd be happy to help with training. Absolutely. And the National Center on State Courts uh, has a number of webinars and um, tiny chats and a bunch of other things that are really helpful as well. There's a there's there's a, a lot of opportunity out there um, for folks who want to learn and engage. And may I add also that at the end, th this recording will be available. And so if there are judges in your jurisdiction who are not here, please refer them to the NGN and NJN for this, you know, for this uh, training. And and let me just say that um, we do a lot of work with the um, Asian Pacific Institute on Gender Based Violence, and they have some really good um, webinars also available on kind of, there's lots of questions about the practice, what's best practice of how to interpret and how to use interpreters and all of that. And we can work with them to identify something that we'll send out to everyone and, or we can record another one just on those issues. But here we're really focusing more on the legal requirements, I guess you could say, than the practical implementation. So. Before before we kind of move on to a little bit more of um, the practical requirements and the and sort of the case studies, I did want to I would be remiss in not noting that our work in Justice Department and in my section um, goes beyond state court language access to include um, a law enforcement language access initiative that we kicked off last year. We have a number of um, agreements and technical assistance. Um, uh, documents that are available on our website, uh, which we'll share with you. Uh, but here we're working with law enforcement agencies across the country, as well as with U.S. attorneys' offices, um, which is really important because they're right there on the ground, right? Um, and Denver and King County, Denver Police Department, King County Sheriff's Office are a couple of examples. There are many more places that we're working to ensure law enforcement language access and the, you know, of course, the connection between providing proper interpretation and translation with law enforcement and getting the getting, you know, getting communication right in law enforcement is so strong to the courts. I think about a case early on in my career where a young woman was arrested for killing her newly born, very premature child. Um, she again spoke uh, an indigenous language and not Spanish and the, the police officer who interrogated her interrogated her only in Spanish and thought she was faking it that she didn't speak uh, Spanish. And, um, you know, in the end, it was a court interpreter, a Spanish speaking court interpreter who figured out that this young woman did not speak Spanish. 
And she then was able to work with the court system and the state court administrator to get a proper interpreter for this young woman. Um, so the connection is so, so clear, right? Um, in addition to the Law Enforcement Language Access Initiative, we are working with our own, within our own Department of Justice and with our federal agencies across the federal government to um, ensure that we are also walking the walk, if you will, that we in the federal agencies are providing meaning, taking meaningful, taking reasonable steps to provide meaningful access to limited English proficient individuals as well. So that means the Civil Rights Division, it means you know, the Bureau of Prisons, um, it means the Department of Homeland Security, it means HHS, it means Medicare, it means all, right, all of the federal agencies, the FTC, the EEOC, the you name it, right, um, the federal agency. So we've recently reviewed 37 new federal agency language access guidance or language access documents um, plans for their federal agencies, and there are a number of first ever language access coordinators in the federal agencies now, including in the Department of Justice, focused explicitly on, exclusively, sorry, on making sure that our own agencies are doing what we need to do to provide language services as well. It's a work in progress, but it's a great opportunity for those of you who are advocates and are running into a problem around language access with the federal agencies. This, there are, there are, points of contact in every federal agency now. And if for some reason uh, that's not something that you can find, you can give us a call, you know, talk, email Lisa or me and we'll figure out who to put you in touch with. So I wanted to make sure I raised that as well. We also do work in the in, in corrections and in child welfare and in a number of er other areas, but those are two big initiatives that we have just started in the last couple of years. And I just want to point out that if you know if you do have an opportunity, I mean, there's a lot of information that Leslie is providing in the chat. Um, I know we're kind of multitasking here um, with this with this topic. So the one of the you know the questions is what can judges and attorneys do to promote language access in family court cases? Uh, it's a huge issue that I ran into um, in doing the work is that there was a basically kind of almost a directive, I believe, out of Denver um, at the time, indicating that there would be no interpreters provided for non-criminal cases. Um, and so I, uh, to me personally, uh, the, you know, this is definitely a situation where attorneys and judges need to stand up. Um, in, in that it is such an important issue. When we talk about access to justice, when we talk about due process, when we talk about fairness, um, we are also with this issue in a very hot political climate um, where people are going to get very upset. People are going to make a lot of noise in your communities. I fully recognize there's some people here who are elected officials. Uh, not everybody's appointed. Um, however, when we are looking at these cases, you know, family court cases where access to children, financial freedom, and, and especially tying this into domestic violence, you know, there are going to be, uh, you know, people on, on whom a uh, course of control has been perpetrated, who for them to even come to court is such a huge deal. Um, and to get them into the door to access the services that, it, you know, I, I think we have, if not a moral, definitely an ethical obligation to step up and do several things. And please, Christine, help me out here. And, and, you know, if, if I miss things, because uh, uh, you know, you're the expert, I'm not. You know, um, but I think one of the first things that we need to do is we need to know our communities. We need to know that the schools that are in the communities, colleges are great resources. Um, there's, you know, uh, I've used, I used a Mandarin uh, Chinese student at, at uh, the University of Southern Colorado at the time to interpret in one of my cases. Um, so, you know, we have a lot, and, and there's a lot of organizations in not only your county, but surrounding counties that are providing services. I know in Pueblo, uh, Sister Nancy is is respected by the Latino community, um, the migrant worker community, as a great resource. So it's teaming up with those people and knowing who your resources in your community are. I think another thing that ju judges and attorneys can do to promote this language access is to 
you know, look at resources that would allow for interpretation. I know there's some questions about, you know, how do we get these forms interpreted? I know there's some resources available. But if you don't have those forms in languages that, that people um, uh, routinely speak in your communities, develop them. And, and you know, there may be other funds available through other organizations that may help with the cost of that. You know, uh, I know that we're very driven by the state court administrator's office, but in the end, the way I've looked at this is this is my case and this is my name on that case. And I can't imagine sitting there like that judge and say, I know this isn't fair to do, but we're going to do it anyways. You know, um, it, it, you know, it, it, you know, it, as we have these conversations with people, issues of the validity and finality of our judgments comes into play, even with the smallest, uh, you know, quote unquote, smallest of cases, which for people is a very, very important cases. But I think it's, I think, first of all, is relationship building. If you do have an interpreters in your community, you should know your interpreters. And, and as judges, once again, as issue of judicial leadership, call meetings with those folks, bring everybody in and look at this just as another resource that you would have to go through um, a community, a coordinated community response, a CCR to deal with. Um, right. So I think there's a question. So the court would still be paying these, but let's say the local hospital or the local school has an interpreter in a language of lesser profusion that they know and trust, the court can, in the if you have the collaborations, identify that person and pay that person to come interpret in Judge Reyes's court. So there's lots of different ways to make this happen, building on the relationships and the existing research. And one of the things that the National Center for State Courts found like way back in 2006, is that where, for those of us that are advocates and attorneys, where community organizations, legal services, victim advocacy programs have relationships with the courts and are working on a variety of coordinated community responses and other kinds of things, those courts do a better job with language access, building on those relationships. So that's the issue. This is a process, as Christine said, every, there's an ideal we're all aiming for, but What's really important is everybody should be able to leave this webinar with some ideas, as Judge Reyes said, that you can go home and start to try to make this happen now and move, take step by step towards something that's more formal if you don't already have something more formal in your courts. And, and that's what we really wanted to make. Right. And I think that that when we are, and I would also encourage you to share the resources. I mean, you may have somebody in your community that you can just send an email statewide and indicate, hey, we've got this person. Um, the other thing I would encourage is constantly ask the people if they're understanding what's going on, you know, in in court. Um, I used to do that routinely um, as part of my pleas. Is asking. I mean, I speak Spanish, so yeah, it's easy for me to to be able to listen to the conversation with the interpreter. But constantly ask um, for your information for the protect your record, whether or not people are understanding what's even happening, because we we skip that sometimes. We just have the interpreter, but we never ask that question. Okay. I think it's back to you, Christine. Oh, okay, great. Well, so I'm just putting in the in the chat um, one of the many communications that we have sent to state court administrators and chief justices over the years around um, Title VI. It may answer some of the questions that I've been seeing in the chat. And so I just wanted to make sure that I provided that. So in addition, when you get to um, the website that Leslie and her team have um, have, have loaded, um, you'll also see, you can also go to www.lep.gov and get these things directly. But um, here are some additional things besides the letters that I just talked about. Um, and, and by the way, um, around the issue of payment, uh, Assistant Attorney General, former Assistant Attorney General Tom Perez used to say, you know, interpretation and translation costs are kind of like heat and electricity and computers. You have to budget it in. Um, you can't run your court without it. 
Um, and, and that is, I thought that was a very useful analogy. So most recently in this fall, we conducted a webinar with the National Center on State Courts. Um, and in doing so, we actually issued a two-page document called Ensuring Language Access in the Courts. And that is a two-page document that you can, that's pretty easy to just sort of take around with you if you want <laughs> um, and keep handy. And it has a lot of the links as well. Um, and uh, other documents, oh, I'm freezing up apparently. Am I freezing for you, Leslie? Oh, you're fine. Okay. Um, so other documents that are available that are longer include a report that we did on language access in state courts um, and a language access planning document. Um, and certainly taking a look at those uh, existing memoranda of agreement will give you really good tools for the kinds of things that state courts that receive federal financial assistance are needing to do across the country. Thanks. Okay, I'm also trying to type and talk at the same time. So let's do a poll. Um, do the courts in your area, so this is one I, where you can check all that apply. So it's multiple answer, right, Mackenzie, hopefully? <laughs> yeah. You know, right. also, Leslie, I know that there's a lot, a huge, you know, a large amount of questions coming through. Um, and if there's anything that relates to judicial, please ask, and if we could save those. Um, you know, I, I'm willing to try to answer them to the best of my ability. Perfect. We're going to do that. We're going to definitely be following up and make sure that between what we do orally in the second half of or the last half hour of this, I'm going to be answering a number of the questions that we've seen in the chat. So hopefully you'll get some clarification then. So let's uh, we've got about 39 percent of you on this poll. Um and then I think we should show it. Um, maybe we get up to 50% and then Mackenzie, you can end it. Um, okay, let's, let's do that. Let's share the results. Now, what I can tell you is I'm ecstatic with some of what I'm seeing here because in the old days, protection orders was like way down. It was the fact that you're, I mean, we could look at this as, cups half full or cups half empty, but generally speaking, it looks like then at least half to 80% of the family court cases, you're getting, you know, protection orders are being routinely provided. That is a big change. And I, I, we should uh, um, appreciate all the work everybody had to do to get there. Criminal is often always the highest, but um, what's good to know and what you can all see is that it, they're, they're, with using the information from this webinar, we can um, really work towards improving that because what you'll see is that under federal language access laws, essentially, they're supposed to be all the same. All court proceedings are supposed to be the same, as well as cut services. And I'll be get to, getting to that in a minute. So what I want to do is tell you another, another story, um, very similar to the story that you heard at the top of this um, from Christine. But uh, what we're gonna do is break it up a little bit and have you be, give you an opportunity to be interactive um, and respond and kind of see where you can intervene as judges and as family lawyers and as victim advocates in these cases to make a difference. So I worked on a case, this case took place in Missouri. Um, Maria Luis was an undocumented K'iche speaking Guatemalan woman with two children. Her youngest Angelica was born in the US um, with respiratory problems. And she took her Angelica to the hospital, the emergency room for treatment. And she spoke Piche, but they gave her a Spanish language interpreter and she didn't understand Spanish um, or very broken Spanish. And so she thought that what they told her was that if the child, you know, basically they gave her some pills and that they, what she thought she was told is that she should come for a follow-up visit, which they scheduled, if um, the baby didn't get better. Um, and in the hospital, Maria Louise was told that, you know, basically they said what they told her, what they, what they said they told her, was that if you don't come back for a follow-up appointment, we'll essentially report you to CPS. And Angelica got better. Maria Louise didn't go back for the visit. 
And, you know, so, and she ended up getting reported to CPS. So how might the hospital's failure to identify, like, this is another poll, how, how, like, the fact that they gave her the wrong interpreter, why is that a problem? How is that harmful to Maria or Luis and her children? I'm going to give you a, few, a couple of minutes, or not even, 30, 30 seconds or 40 seconds to respond, because I'm going to keep moving this along. And we got about 30 of you, 30% of you. And just to tell you, there's, this is a real case that occurred, and we have a whole story of it in a publication that I did. And we'll, I'll try to put that in the chat later. It's definitely in the materials. It's, called the, it's on the materials page we sent. It's the Maria L. story. Okay, let's uh, see the poll results. And so people are saying they could be incorrect treatment, right? They could tell her, you know, she, how she's supposed to give the pills or the treatment to her child, she won't know. Um, she doesn't understand the instructions um, that were given by the doctor. As in this case, it could trigger a child welfare report. And fortunately, only a few, a couple of you said that there's no real impact because the child got better. Okay. So let's continue with Maria's story, Maria Luisa's story. The hospital turned out she report they reported Maria Luis to Child Protective Services when she failed to do come for the follow up appointment. CPS arrived at her house and they brought the police, uniformed police officers, with her. And uh, did they have any interpreters? No, they had no interpreters in Quiche. I don't even think they had interpreters in Spanish. They took her two children and placed them in foster care and Maria Luis was detained and turned over to Department of Homeland Security for deportation. While she was in DHS custody, Nebraska, this is, you're right, this is Nebraska case, not Missouri case, sorry about that. Nebraska initiated a dependency case against Maria Luis and the notices from the court were sent in English and arrived at the DHS detention center where they were not in Quiche, she got no interpretation, and in the end, DHS did not take her to dependency court proceedings. So the next one is, and we think this is yeah. So um, when we look at this, what would the judge or could the judge have um, the power to do uh, regarding the language access issues that have come up? Um, so we've got you know we're out of the hospital, she's in detention, and court has started. Um, what can the judge do? What sh or, or, or anybody, I mean, if you're an advocate, what should the judge be doing um, in your opinions or, or with the attorneys? And go ahead and type in the chat some of your thoughts and we'll just give you a few moments and maybe why are they so quick to separate the children and put them in foster care? Find our Akiche interpreter, ask. Other ideas, Judge Reyes, what would you do in a situation like this? Or Christine, what have you seen courts do? Well, you know, um, I think one of the things is, you know, as a judge, my, you know, power is very limited as it comes outside of the courthouse setting. So hospital, you know, not so much what I can do, but when we look at other organizations that are uh, accountable to the court, um, I think we're back to this issue of judicial leadership. Mm -hmm. If you don't have some of these resources available and you have an awareness as the expert uh, who in, in the law and also an expert in what's happening in your community um, in the sense of um, having an understanding of, uh, of, of who lives in your community, who appears before you, what the needs of the court are. If anybody knows the needs of the court, it's judges. We do know when we don't have resources. The question is, what do we do about getting them? So when I look at this uh, issue about the role of CPS is playing, if I'm having an issue and I'm seeing cases coming where there's no converse, and I've asked, who spoke to this person? What language did they speak? If I see that does not exist, maybe what I could do as part of my judicial leadership is require as maybe a dependency judge who gets those cases or or um, or whatever 
other way that comes before me, that maybe I take that initiative and get CPS to get the ball rolling with better communication so I can have better information. This is what we're talking about here now is judicial officers making decisions on bad information. And, and just another thing is, is you can make sure your notices don't go out only in English or don't go in Spanish to somebody who speaks Quiche, right? Or, and I'll be talking about this in a few minutes, you can also make sure there's a special, there's a particular number and if email contact at the Department of Homeland Security that is responsible for making sure people in their detention come to court. And there's a policy governing that. So that those- I'm, can, I, can I ask a quick question that just came to mind, um, Leslie? If I'm the judge and I don't have those going out, can they file that complaint in that case against me for not giving them that information? Or does this like a statewide thing? Can they say, hey, Judge Reyes, in this case, did never provided me with this? I'm going to try and answer this and Christine will check me. So basically, if you have a case and there's a problem with language access, you're not getting something that the law says you should provide, then you can file a complaint. There are There's a complaint form at the um, on Christine's website, and we have a link to it. We actually worked up a sample. So if you want to see, like in our materials, there's actually a sample where we made one up around a protection order case. And you could see how easy it is to fill out these forms. And so sometimes it's an individual, sometimes it's a system. It can be, I think, any of that. Did I get that right, Christine? Yeah, that's right. And, and so um, that's what some of the agreements that we have are with county courts, you know, specific courts, perhaps, um, for sp specific judicial districts within a state and some are with the whole state. Now, we're not, um, we don't have jurisdiction over youth, particularly, Judge Reyes, of course. Um, but, you know, certainly what we would do is look to ensure that the judges in that system are complying with the requirements of Title VI as well. Um, just one point about indigenous languages and, and maybe languages of lesser diffusion in general. Um, when we have, when we in the Department of Justice have had to uh, find interpreters in ourselves, um, either through the U.S. Attorney's offices or in the Civil Rights Division or some other litigating section, um, there are a number of places that we go when we try and find them. So some some of that is to the federal courts themselves and say, you know, y'all, do you all have anybody who's ever interpreted effectively in Quiche uh, or in, re, you know, have you, do you have a relay? And um, yeah, I can remember one case in Florida, the best person available was somebody who knew the situation very well because they were part of the community and had a conflict. And so we had to go to, we had to find somebody from California to help us out. Um, and and went through the court systems um, to help find the both the federal and local court systems and and the National Association of Judicial Interpreters and Translators. Um, I know the California Rural Legal Assistance or Legal Aid I can't remember which has a whole project around indigenous um, language uh, interpreters and getting the word out to folks about their rights. There are, there's a lot of work in this area. I think the ABA is going to be talking somewhat about um, indigenous languages in their upcoming revised standards. And so um, you are not alone is my point. You don't have to be, you know, as a judge or an advocate, be searching for that one person on your own. Um, and, there are there are resources. And what I would say is if you are looking for something and you can't find it anywhere, try the Seattle courts. They are done their own job. They've identified people in the most number, number of languages I know of, and they've certified them themselves. So you could remotely use one of their interpreters for one of these lesser profusion languages. And they, you know, they've already done some of that homework because they know that's a qualified interpreter for you. And there are, and there are a lot of judicial organizations that have information. So if you need to approach your judges on this, I think it's better to be, you know, to have that kind of resource available to see what is happening on a nationwide basis, or maybe even in within your state. So if you are going to approach your judges on the issue, 
I would go through, um, you know, the NJN, the National Council, National Judicial College. There's a lot of information in, in those websites that you can share with your judges. That's the way I would approach a judge. And just one more thing is the NCSC, the National Center on State Courts, their membership organizations include the state court administrators and the chief justices. They also um, host the Com Council on Language Access Coordinators. This is sort of a statewide, these, these are the statewide language access coordinators. And that group, so if you got a, if you were looking for a particular language or a particular policy or something like that, um, the language services unit at um, at National Center for State Courts um, would also be a, a very useful a very useful place to go. Great. Okay, I'm going to finish Maria Luisa's story, and then I'm going to run through a number of um, slides as well on so answering some of the questions that people have been answering. So, Maria Luisa, it turns out after she she got deported to Guatemala, Nebraska Child Protective Services called her. Um, in, in speaking in Spanish to explain a parenting plan. She found a priest who actually who spoke Spanish in Quiche, who was able to interpret to her and help her, you know, essentially try to participate in the parenting plan from in Guatemala, where she signed up for parenting classes and did all of that. But um, the parental rights of both of her children were terminated and her children remained in foster care. And so, oops, sorry. So what I think, Judge Reyes, we've pretty much answered this, but if there's anything else you want to, Judge Reyes, is there anything else, uh, you know, in, as to how you might um, direct the state in terms of communicating with a, an LEP parent or, you know, how important it is, particularly in termination of parental rights cases or, in, you know, when somebody's being harmed in a civil protection order case and things like that to do, you know, to play a role in making sure that that language access happens in time so that things like termination of parental rights aren't triggered. You're on mute, Judge Reyes. I, th I think that there's ways, I mean, we're talking about the age, sometimes with like a, a termination case, um, you know, the age of the child is important because of those federal time limits, which you have to move cases. But I think that judges, if they see that it's not an issue of the parent not doing, but more of a communication issue or, or a finding issue, um, I think that you can, to some degree, slow that case down a little bit and make sure because, I mean, there's a lot of rec uh, requirements before you can terminate. Um, and and I think if a if a parent has been deported, I don't know if you can make the kind of findings that you should be making in order to order termination, which is like the non-compliance and uh, of, of parenting plans. Um, the other thing is that knowing where people are at and requiring CPS to know where they're at and to constantly inform you of what their status is. So I think you you hold people's feet to the fire when it comes to any case, but definitely in this situation um, where the parent may be may be gone, you know, um, um, and, and just re, you know, and then maybe even bring it on the docket quicker, and, mm -hmm. and so that you can have more review hearings, so you have a better grasp as to what's happening with this case. Right, and so. To all of you, if to the, the judges or the family lawyers or the victim advocates, how would you go about getting a Quiche interpreter if you know you've got a case coming before you um, and you know this person doesn't speak Spanish or English, what steps would you take in your jurisdiction? And I'm going to let you put some things in the chat um, because I'm a little bit concerned about time, so I want to continue moving forward. But the point is, there's a lot of resources we've discussed that will help answer this question. And part of it is really good language access advocacy, meaning if this is my case and I'm representing Maria Luis or I'm representing a battered immigrant who speaks a language that I may know that they don't have interpreters readily available in my local court, language line is an idea informing the court in advance when I'm coming to a hearing, that kind of language access advocacy can be really important. And depending on the type of hearing, if it's a, if it's a child welfare hearing, 
I would put it, the onus on the state to get those because they're the ones who are seeking termination. So not just necessarily on the on the person's attorney, but requiring the representative of the state to, to do to exercise due diligence. And we'll share these great ideas that you're putting in the chat with the whole group afterwards. I'll have one of my students write it up. But I want to tell you the end great result, although it was a very painful one to get there, because I believe this was a two and a half year separation um, in this case. Um, the end result of the Maria Louise case is that we got a unanimous decision. I, I actually lived this case. Um, <laughs> we did the amicus brief in this case, and, and I did all the negotiations ultimately with DHS, Department of Homeland Security in this case. But basically, the, we got a unanimous decision from the Nebraska Supreme Court that parents have a constitutional right to custody absent unfitness. And unfitness has nothing to do with what language you speak and nothing to do with what your immigration status is. And that that constitutional right to care and custody of your children applies to all families without regard to immigration status. It applies to people of parents in detention. It applies to people that have been deported. There's an overriding presumption that the parent-child relationship is constitutionally protected and is in the best interest of the child to stay with or be reunited with their parents without regard to immigration status or English speaking ability. And it basically, this court case also instructs courts not to do a comparison of whether you think in this case, Angelica and her brother will have a better life somehow growing up speaking English in, in the US instead of being at home with their mother in Guatemala. Um, and what also came out of this, so, Essentially, what came out of this case is that Maria Luis was reunited, and we got permission for this picture from her, um, with her two children. But they were separated for two and a half years. And so what happened was, is, and the Department of Homeland Security realized they'd made some major mistakes here too. Not only was it language access issues, but not providing, not bringing somebody into detention to court. And so um, ultimately what happened was they gave her humanitarian parole for two and a half years to come and reunite with her children. And these new, and there's, there've been a series of directives that have been issued built on this case that requires affirmative and ongoing inquiries in immigration enforcement proceedings about whether the person that may be detained or being questioned is a parent. Um, so judges, you should know, and family lawyers, you should know that getting court orders, ordering people to have custody of children and those and placing children, people in Kyle's care actually prevents that, helps ensure that the parent without regard to immigration status is one of the factors that makes them less likely to be removed. Um, we have a whole bench card on who is likely to be removed. And by the way, it's basically only people with criminal convictions. So you shouldn't be thinking that it, because somebody is undocumented, they're gonna necessarily disappear from the United States. And so these policies instruct how DHS is responsible for bringing parents and guardians to court to be um, involved in these proceedings. So things like what happened to Maria Luis don't happen again. Um, if an immigrant parent is detained, as a judge, you can order the DHS, bring them to the courtroom, make them available for a remote hearing. Um, you, you can make sure that the person who is the parent in the case, um, in a family court case or a domestic violence case involving one of their children or child abuse case, gets language in their primary language. And you should absolutely, and this was a mistake in the Maria Louise case, and I probably suspect it might have been in other cases, I'm sure it happens a lot, but notifying the parents council is really important. The Mexican council the Guatemalan council and a number of other councils I've trained, the Japan, Japanese and French and a whole bunch of them, they actually will hire and counsel for their, their, their citizens. But and let's say, so use the Vienna convention in order to get the council access. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I don't think that 
I don't know in state courts whether you can use it directly, but the council, the council, it's will um, actually get involved in cases involving their citizens and particularly custody and room and things like that. But right. I can answer your question, Judge. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's the Vienna Convention that you can go to get them access to their consulates. Yeah. And so you may, um, you may be right. So what I want to do because of some of the questions we got, and I also want to leave time for more questions if we have it, is I want to review some of the details of the DOJ guidelines on language access to the courts. And Christina, jump in and help me if I miss anything or whatever. But so limited English prof proficient persons are to be provided qualified interpreters by the courts. And that's for parties, defendants, witnesses, and persons who pres whose presence is necessary and appropriate to the proceedings. So the parent of a child in a delinquency case, the parent of a minor in a protection order or a custody case, or a child, a child welfare case. Um, and it's in all courtroom proceedings, civil, criminal, protection order. There might be administrative proceedings. And it's not just the trial, it's motions and status hearings. It's anything involving the case. And LEP, as we've said many times on this webinar, LEP individuals should not incur any fees for these services. In addition, and this answers a lot of your questions earlier on, LEP persons are also to be provided qualified interpreters, not only in courtrooms, clerk's offices, records rooms, information counters, if, the, if Judge Reyes is going to, if is sitting in a divorce case and arguing uh, and ordering alternative dispute resolution, which shouldn't be happening in domestic violence cases, by the way, if there's a pro se clinic or there's people helping victims fill out protection orders um, or a court order, Judge Reyes orders the batter under batter's treatment or appoints a guardian ad litem or a court psychologist or paternity testing, drug testing, child advocates, all of those things, interpreters should be provided. They're considered court services. Anything you wanna add there, Ms. Christine? No, I think that's great. I think there's a, as, as, as folks know, we are still um, seeking, we are still reaching for this. Yes, but this is what the letters to the court say is supposed to happen. This is, a, this is the reach, this is what we should expect, and this is what we should be collaboratively working for, taking Judge Reyes up on his CCR analogy. And the, the, this is what we should be collaboratively working for with courts in our communities. In addition, the 2018 uh, letter to the Chief Justices at the state court and state court administrators says the following that I, and I'm gonna quote these because I think it's really important that there's a the federal requirement to provide language access as language assistance to LEP individuals applies notwithstanding whatever state or local laws or court rules may be in place regarding language access. And it's because dispensing justice fairly and efficiently and accurately is what the cornerstone of the judiciary and what judge, what courts are all about. And language access service expenses, as Christine said, are not ancillary. They should be treated like turning on the lights and having computers. Right, but I think this, I mean, you, we have to recognize too that this is hard to, to stand out in your courthouse and stand up for, for what's right with the politics that you have to deal with. But, you know, I mean, but I think that we have, like I said, an, an obligation to make it happen, even if nobody else around us is. And, and I will also say there've been a lot of questions about translations. As a domestic violence lawyer, I did, I represented only LEP individuals for 17 years of litigation in domestic violence cases. And what I will tell you is translating court orders, having the forms translated so the translator on site, interpreter on site can fill in the court order and the perpetrator walks away with a translated order is super important for both domestic violence perpetrators and domestic violence victims because they can't follow the orders if they don't know what they say. And they can't be expected, they shouldn't be expected to remember the details of the order without having a copy of the order, just like somebody who speaks English does. And so it really is a best practice to have those. And these are the rules about 
what kinds of information should be um, translated. And that's, I, I have a, a document on that. We have just about three minutes to go. So I'm gonna summarize a couple of more points. As lawyers and advocates, we need to be language access advocates. We need to plan and give notice to the courts, to the hospitals, to the child welfare agency, to the where we're applying for TANA for food stamps and let them know we're coming with somebody who speaks Spanish, Hindi, whatever the language is so that they can plan in advance and we're not waiting for them to scramble finding an interpreter. Um, and we can educate everyone about in our communities about their language access responsibilities, as you heard on this call, build the relationships. If a police report is not taken using a qualified interpreter, go get it amended because it is important in domestic violence cases to have accurate police reports. It's important in criminal cases to do so. This is the link to the complaint forms um, that you can file and, and uh, from the with, with DOJ. And I, as I said, we'll be providing you a sample. Um, and I will just say that research has found that when courts are providing language access um, and signing you and T visa certifications, even when immigration enforcement goes up, immigrant crime victims, domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, child abuse, continue to go to those courts in greater numbers than courts that are not providing language access and not signing U visas and not doing SIJ orders. And so I can't emphasize enough how, in terms of access to justice, um, this is an important issue and it really works because what we see is that these immigrant survivors who come to court to get protection orders bring other women to court as well. Um, that they know in the community that haven't sought help. Um, I think I've talked about that. Um, for last closing remarks, back to you, Christine. Oh, well, thank you. So this is just an example, as I say to, to folks in my office, um, you know, the when you're looking into changing systems, it is not about just the Department of Justice and the state court or the local court. It is about the, often I say a three-legged stool, but it's really not. It's a table with lots of legs um, because of course the third the third major leg would be the community, right? The, the Those who are LEP or, and are represented by those who are, uh, but, and are represented, um, so they're advocates. But in addition, you know, the interpreter community, the, um, the advocacy community in general, um, the ABA is working now, as I said, to uh, to update the language access standards, and that can be a helpful tool. The National Center and State Courts, the Language Services Unit there, the state court leaders, all of the folks that Judge Reyes mentioned, um, this group of folks, there are so many partners in this work. And I, I, just, I do want to just say, with regard to one question about how to file a complaint with the Department of Justice and what happens when someone is not willing to, is, is afraid to tell their story, right? Because they're afraid of the results of telling their story, whether that be directly in court or from some other agency. What I can tell you is that we accept complaints from third parties all the time. Now we do need to be able to investigate the situation, right? And so if, if figuring out how to resolve the matter requires us to know what actually happened in that individual case, we may need to get the transcript and those kinds of things. There are times when um, we don't have to do that because we have we have identified that there's a systematic problem that goes well beyond the particular uh, example that led to this complaint. Um, and there are times when we have um, issued letters where we've anonymized um, you know, names of, we've anonymized everything about the examples that are given of violations, but many times we don't even have to put all of that in writing at all because we're working effectively with the courts to change the system. So it's going to depend on, um, but but it's definitely worth raising with us. Um, feel free to, like I said, email our office, or send the complaint in, and if we need more information, we will ask for it. Um, and then finally, I would just say that there's an anti-retaliation provision, and we have had circumstances where folks who have filed complaints, particularly interpreters, 
um, have been retaliated against by court systems and we have um, achieved uh, monetary settlements in those cases. So I just want to make sure folks know it doesn't happen very often, but if it does happen, there is a protection. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I've got to appreciate everybody staying too. Uh, and um, my Christine and Leslie, thank you for the National uh, Judicial Network putting this together. And you, Christine, showing up from DOJ as the person. Uh, um, just, I can't imagine um, uh, how your knowledge is going to influence so many people uh, around the country. So thank you. Thank you. And thanks everybody for participating for all your questions. We'll make sure we'll review and make sure that all of them get answered and that any that we weren't able to answer live, we will provide you more links and more information uh, for Q&A following the webinar. So thank you, Christine. Thank you, Judge Reyes. Thanks to all of you. And uh, we look forward to making this a much more language accessible world and courts. Thank you.